Our next speaker I'm so, so excited about it is Dr. Carl Hart. He is a neuropsychopharmacologist, which means that he studies brain, drugs, and behavior. It really makes sense at this conference because none, none of those things act in isolation. He's the chair of the psychology department at Columbia University. He has over 200 articles published in peer-reviewed journals. His book, High Price, won the Penn E.O. Wilson Literary Science Award, which is an award that was established for books such as Silent Spring by Rachel Carson, so very, very prestigious. He also speaks out and writes for the regular media on racism in law enforcement and our criminal justice system. And for me personally, as a mentor, he inspires me to use my power to help people with less privilege than I, and not just become some kind of cog in the machine. He is always courageous. He's never afraid to say the things that might piss off people with more power. And uh, earlier, Lynn showed that picture of Trump holding hands with Duterte from the Philippines. He hates Carl Hart. So. <laughs> Thank you, Joel, for that lovely introduction. Um, as I came in the room, I realized I was speaking after Lynn Paltrow. Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't have taken this invitation if I knew I was speaking after Lynn. Um, but I'm, I'm really, I'm really happy to be here with you guys. Uh, it's a beautiful day in California compared to New York. So, uh, so thank you guys for the weather. I'm so happy to be here with you guys. And I'm also happy to be here with you guys, too, uh, for this reason. I, I, I used to be in the US military, and I used to carry an M16 for the, for the country. I was a cop at one point. And um, you know, I'm kind of embarrassed, actually, about um, what I was doing in the military, because I wasn't really thinking. Uh, and it came full circle recently when um, my kid does karate, and he was, he, he's in a class with uh, a guy who works at the New York State Psychiatric Institute with me, who, who he works there, and uh, his kid is in the same karate class as my kid, and this guy is Russian, and he served in the Russian military at the same time I was in the U.S. military, and that was during the Cold War, and you know, we were enemies, and this guy and I are like great friends, but we could have been on the battlefield trying to kill each other for idiots, basically. And um, <laughs> so uh, I'm really happy to not be doing that sort of thing and instead trying to um, show all of our humanity. So uh, thank you all for the invitation. But now what, what I do is I give people drugs for a living. Uh, I get people high. Um, I get people high uh, in order to characterize what drugs actually do versus what anecdotally we say they do or what you hear. Um, and so there is a large database that evaluates the effects of drugs in people. Uh, the problem is that database is not translated very well. Um, much of the writing is awful, including my own when I wrote uh, almost exclusively uh, in the scientific literature. So one of the things I'm trying to do is try to translate it and help you all understand what it means and try and, try and communicate with you guys. Um, as I go about this work, uh, one of the sort of things that guides me in this work is trying to make sure I see your humanity and everybody else's humanity. And this sort of guiding principle was helped shape by me reading the works of James Baldwin. And I want to start with, with a quote from James Baldwin. James Baldwin um, said that the paradox of education is precisely this, that as one begins to become conscious, one begins to examine the society in which he is being educated, he or she is being educated. Now, he used the, t the term conscious, and that's the term I grew up with, but now the term is woke. Uh, same sort of, the same thing, um, but it forces us, if we're educated people, to look at our society 
and look at what's going on in our society. Um, and that's, that's what I'm trying to do. And in trying to do that, today I'd like to share with you guys um, a, a few things. I'm just going to give you an agenda of what I'm going to say. Uh, I'm going to talk about some basics, some drug basics, some things that uh, probably that, that relates more to how we've been misinformed uh, in general about drugs. And then I'm going to talk specifically about uh, prenatal cannabis exposure and subsequent cognitive functioning in the offspring. Um, and then I'll, I'll, I'll uh, come back and make contact with some of the stuff that Lynn was talking about, particularly as it relates to race. Um, and then I'll wrap up. Um, so let's begin. Um, the first thing that, the first sort of basic that we must understand, we must understand that drug mis miseducation in this country is the standard. This is what we do. We do this in part to terrify the public. Um, it's deliberate. I, you know, I, I try to think about it in the most kind terms, but after studying this stuff for 25, 30 years, I've concluded that it's deliberate. And I have a clip to show you about the current sort of opioid crisis and how we educate people about heroin. As I said, we have a database, a burgeoning database that you, the public, have paid for through your taxes to support researchers like me, we have a burgeoning database that tells you what heroin does and doesn't do. But yet, our public service announcements are like this. Can we get some balls? Reception 
that bore the hell out of me. And, or, or I teach, seriously, I teach every Friday night in Sing Sing Prison. Uh, it's a maximum security prison in New York City. My cousin is a student in my class. He's there for 25 to life. Uh, and then I go to this prison and I see these people, these predominantly 1,600 men, predominantly black and brown. These are the people who we kind of forget about in the United States because we don't go to the prisons and then we see what they're subjected to um, for these extended periods. Not to say that people shouldn't pay the price for some crime that they committed, but these extended periods where we've just forgotten about. And then some of the sort of students that are so bright, they rival my Columbia students. And then all of these sort of things that one has to deal with struggle with a black man going into a prison, predominantly black men, who are the inmates, and I'm also treated like a prisoner when I'm there, because that's the way, that's the only sort of, sort of a program behavior that this correctional officers have. So all of these sort of struggles, you can imagine people who have these kind of pressures and struggles, heroin is excellent for kind of turning off those troubling thoughts. Um, but we still have to think about the addictive potential because this is the kind of thing that we worry about with drugs like heroin. Heroin, certainly there, if you, there are people who use heroin who are addicted. But the thing we have to keep in mind is that the vast majority of people who use heroin are not addicted. 75% or so are not addicted. And, uh, but we act as if you use heroin, you become addicted. That's not how it works. That's not how it works, not only for heroin, but for any drug, it doesn't work that way. Most of the people who use any of these drugs we're talking about, crack cocaine, methamphetamine, all of them, most of the people who use them are not addicted. In fact, they are pretty, they're upstanding people. Most of them are upstanding people. They are pillars of their community. They they go to work, they take care of their family, they pay their taxes, and in some cases they become president of the United States. <laughs> All three of these guys use drugs as young men. Now this is not to besmirch their reputation because they all serve their country and that's a tough job. No matter what your politics, they all contributed to the country. Um, and, and so, uh, so my point is not to besmirch their reputation. My point is, maybe this guy should have used them. <laughs> that, that, that's not the point. But, he, <laughs> but this guy says that he, 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 he's proud of the fact that he hasn't used drugs. He wears it like a badge of honor. But that's not my point. My major point. My major point is this, is that most people who use drugs, they don't need treatment, nor do they need drug, uh, jail. They need to be treated humanely. That's the a, that's a point. That's the major point. Most of the people are not addicted. Another point is that simply knowing that someone uses drugs does not provide enough information to tell you whether they are meeting their obligations. All you know is that they use drugs. And I knew Lynn would be here because uh, 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 Lynn, one of, one of the things that she taught me, actually Lynn brought me uh, to this community. Uh, I now serve on her board at the National Advocate for Pregnant Women. Um, but one of her favorite things, I'm sure she showed you guys her pee. <laughs> that's, what, that's what she does. <laughs> And she tells us that testing positive doesn't tell you anything about abuse, uh, addiction, the frequency of abuse, um, nor parental neglect. Uh, parental neglect is this catch-all term that covers everything from poverty to drug use. Uh, but testing, po testing positive doesn't tell you anything about that. Um, and so, as I think about testing positive for 
drugs. One of the drugs that people test positive for more than any other drug is marijuana, in part because marijuana stays in the system longer than these other drugs, other recreational drugs. And marijuana is becoming increasingly more important in our society as states change their laws about marijuana. We now have 29 states plus uh, Puerto Rico, Guam, um, and D.C. that allow uh, folks to use marijuana for some medical purpose, and not in states that have legalized it for recreational purposes. Given that this is the case, that means that we might have more people testing positive for marijuana. And so the question for me is, what does that mean for parents, mothers, uh, mothers or expecting mothers who, who test positive for marijuana. Uh, what does that mean in terms of how we see them in the courts? What does it mean for their offspring? Uh, particularly when we have this assumption that we operate under. Our assumption is that drug use inevitably harms the developing fetus. That's our assumption that we make. We, we, we make this assumption something like marijuana, you smoke marijuana during pregnancy, it will harm the developing fetus. That's the assumption that we make. It will harm the, the developing fetus later in life, or if it doesn't show up immediately. Now, these harms were, or this assumption was nicely summarized in a recent publication uh, by our Ch Chasna. Some of you all might remember Ira from being the person who first described uh, the crack babies that weren't. But Ira came to national prominence because he um, wrote the first paper on the crack babies and published it in the New England Journal of Medicine and got a lot of attention. Um, he recently published an opinion piece in uh, the American Journal of um, Obstetrics and Gynecology, um, in which he was laying out these assumptions as if they were facts in terms of what marijuana does to the developing fetus and subsequent life. Um, Ira uh, made some logical errors in his thinking. And so one of the things that Sierra Torres, the postdoc who worked, worked with me, uh, did was she wrote a letter to the editor and got published to point out the logical errors that Ira had made. Um, notably, he, he made errors about the subsequent cognitive functioning of the offspring who had been prenatally exposed to cannabis. He made these sweeping generalizations that the data just did not support. And Sierra wrote a letter and got published to point this out. Um, and then Ira responded, and his response was basically, uh, he, he didn't say that, but he did say it. It's, it's in the letter. But it's not, this isn't about Ira. It's, the point is, is that he um, has a position that many people have. And the position is not based on the evidence. And Sierra just tried to correct that or point this out. Um, and this led us to do a larger critical review of the literature, uh, the, the, prenatal, the, the prenatal cannabis exposure literature and on subsequent cognitive functioning of the offspring. So we did a literature review, um, and this is just kind of an overview of the summary of, of one of the things that we found was that there were a small number of researchers who were actually doing this research, uh, about five groups of researchers, three groups from the United States, two groups in Canada, and one group in Jamaica. Um, and there were 29 studies published that were that looked at cognitive functioning on the subsequent cognitive functioning in these offspring, and there were a total of, of about 400 measures that, when we combined all the measures that they looked at, these cognitive measures, um, and we critically 
evaluated all of the papers, one by one, as opposed to doing something like a meta-analysis where you just put everything in the pile. It's like garbage in, garbage out. And that's what you get, basically. And people like meta-analysis, but meta-analysis, it's not critically looking at every paper. But meta-analysis have become popular. Uh, and it's disturbing to somebody like me who looks at every detail of the studies. Where in meta-analysis, you don't have to look at every detail. And, but we look at every detail of, this, of these studies. And, and just, just an overview of the findings, what we found was of, of these sort of 400 measures, on 90% of them or so, there were no differences between the children who were prenatally exposed to cannabis and those who were not prenatally exposed to cannabis. But we did find some differences uh, such that about 9% nine, about nine of the measures, the children who were prenatally exposed performed more poorly than those who were not prenatally exposed on about 10% of those measures. And then they outperformed the, the control group on 2% of the measures. Uh, um, that's the kind of general thing that we found. Now, it's important for us to kind of understand or think about what's the clinical or the functional significance of that sort of 10% or these findings. What's the functional or clinical significance? When we think about functional or clinical significance, it's important for us to differentiate statistical difference from clinical or functional difference. Uh, in the scientific literature, we don't do this very often, in part because it's, it's difficult and uh, it's really difficult to show a functional or clinical uh, significantly different uh, effect. Uh, but just, uh, here's an example, this is just an example. If you have something like a measure of IQ, uh, if you focus your attention on the white bars, this would be the score for the controls, the blue bar would be the, the scores for the prenatal, prenatally cannabis exposed individuals. You can see there is a statistical difference, for example, between these two, two groups. This is statistically significant, this difference. You can see that. But what does that mean? Well, you can have a statistically significant difference on IQ score, but both groups, if you focus over here, can remain within the normal range. You know, so if we think about the range of normal IQ from about 85 to 115, you will have some normal human variability within the normal range. And that's what you find on most of these measures of statistically significant difference. So that you might see a statistically significant difference, but functionally or clinically, it's just normal sort of human variability. It's like saying, oftentimes what happens in the literature is that when you see this sort of statistically significant difference, people say, oh, this group had a deficit, or they were impaired. It's like saying that this group got an A, and this group got an A minus. Therefore, the group that's got an A minus is cognitively impaired. That's what it's like saying oftentimes. And that's inappropriate. So that's why it's critically important to think about clinical significance or functional significance, that's why we have normative databases. The normative databases helps us to put this in functional con in the functional context. Uh, okay, now I should tell you there was one study of the 29 studies that reported a functional difference on one measure, uh, on, on a measure of quantitative reasoning. They found that the group that was exposed to cannabis during, um, uh, uh, while um, uh, in utero uh, performed uh, not only statistically uh, uh, more poorly than the control group, but also 
they were below the normal range on that one measure. So there, there's, there's, there's one group that found that. Uh, there were a number of sort of caveats to the finding. Uh, the women who were in the cannabis, the, the mothers who had, who had used uh, cannabis uh, in this, uh, for uh, this group, they, they were, uh, they, their educational attainment levels were lower. Um, their um, uh, their uh, income was lower. And there were a number of other things related to the mother that is important to consider uh, when we were thinking about these scores. And we, we take these scores um, uh, when we contextualize these scores. Uh, but uh, the Goldsmith study, uh, 2008, was a study that found that one uh, functional difference. Now, so what, what's the bottom line? The bottom line from our review is that the current evidence does not suggest that prenatal cannabis exposure alone is associated with clinical, clinically relevant cognitive functioning deficits. Now, I should, I should take a step back, because I didn't say this. Now, this paper is not published. Um, I have a number of publications. I love to write. I know how to get things published. This paper has been so difficult to get published. Um, I was actually invited to write this paper, and it was not accepted. Um, and I never had that happen before. Um, so this is not a. So I, I just I, I tell that I tell you that I tell you that because it's not peer reviewed yet. Uh, that's one. That's important. Uh, and two, it's been really difficult to get a paper published that's saying that uh, the, the clinical relevance of the current findings related to prenatal cannabis exposure uh, are unclear, or they are uh, the, the meaning of those are, we, we don't know. Uh, it's, it's a difficult thing to get this kind of this, this paper published. Uh, and, and so I just want you to, to know that before uh, citing this work, but I'm going to get it published. I'm going to work hard to get it published because I feel like I owe it to the public to get this published. Uh, but it's not published yet. Uh, another thing that you should know is, uh, as I pointed out, um, there's only a few groups of researchers who work in this area. And on the one hand, you know, it's like they have the expertise, so that's a great thing. But it would be nice to have other researchers also working in this area in order to replicate the findings uh, outside of these other groups. And you should also know that the research is primarily funded by NIDA. And NIDA is, uh, uh, of course, uh, the National Institute on Drug Abuse, and it's a government-funded organization, and we like to think about government-funded organizations as being impartial or, or unbiased. Uh, that's not the case. Uh, I served on NIDA's advisory council, and it's biased. Uh, I've written about this. Uh, it's biased towards uh, the negative effects of drugs, and it's in part biased because its mission requires it to be biased. The mission says that uh, it's an NIH institute, and so NIH focuses on pathology, and NIDA focuses on pathology, the bad things that happen related to drugs. And so it's not necessarily the people's fault at NIDA, but you should just know that's the mission, to be biased toward the negative effects of drugs. Um, OK. Um, so despite the sort of empirical reality, the researchers in many of these papers make statements such as this. Women should be advised not to use these substances during pregnancy, and that the exposed offspring may have long-term subtle deficits, even though the evidence doesn't support this sort of thing. Now, now I'm not suggesting that people should go out and smoke marijuana during pregnancy. I'm not, I'm not suggesting that at all. Um, but what I am concerned about is that we make statements that are not tied to the data. And as a scientist, I'm just trying to figure it out. Um, and 
I understand that some scientists, and I, I applaud this, may be erring on the side of caution. And so they say it's better to err on the side of caution because in that way we don't run the risk of having someone go out there and harm themselves. I get it. I completely understand that. The concern I have about erring on the side of caution, though, is that the scientists who do so act as if there's no consequence to erring on the side of caution when it comes to drugs. There are consequences. It helps to create this environment that we believe any drug, any use of certain drugs is bad. And it also contributes to, for example, journalists writing articles that are consistent with half-truths or consistent with uh, the conclusions that are drawn that are not based on the data. We also have as these public service announcements, film, documentary filmmakers, uh, they depict drug users in these distorted sort of ways based on some of these conclusions that go beyond the actual data. And then, of course, policy, misguided policy, is oftentimes made as a result of this sort of thing, erring on the side of caution. And so when we err on the side of caution, we have to understand that there are consequences to that, too. And we have to weigh this. We have to weigh the consequences, the potential benefits and consequences. But we haven't really uh, uh, the carefully enough weighed those sort of potential consequences. So that's the sort of, uh, that's thinking about the scientists in the most positive light. I also think about it in a darker light. Or I think, too, that we exaggerate drug effects because there are benefits to doing that. Humans don't engage in behavior repeatedly if there's no function or benefit. But we engage in this behavior repeatedly, I am suggesting, because there are specific benefits to a number of groups, including scientists. Our grants are funded, our papers are published, for example, if you want to get a paper published, uh, one of the easiest sort of things to do these days is study children, adolescents, children, who have been prenatally exposed to any drug, and then do a brain imaging measure, it will be published. One of the things I do in my seminar class is Rather than have my students uh, write a 20-page term paper, which they will never read, nor will I. Uh, <laughs> rather, than that, rather than do that, I require them to go to the literature, this literature, and uh, the recent literature, and write a letter to the editor that's publishing it. And so they have to critique these papers. And they have to see, like, uh, did the authors uh, draw conclusions beyond their data? And a number of my students have gotten their letters to the editor published. And many of those papers contain brain imaging. Because the brain imaging, when you have brain imaging and the prenatal drug exposure, it's so easy to get published. And so it's easy to point out the errors that people have made. Uh, any professors in the house, do that exercise with your students and you'll see uh, what I mean. So I, as I was saying, there were specific benefits to exaggerating these harmful effects of drugs. And it also, this also, when we exaggerate, it allows us not to deal with the, top, the problems that poor people face. The real problems, you know, like unemployment, sub-education, substandard education, low income, all the problems that, as Lynn was pointing out, is like, if you don't want to have any problems here, don't be poor. Um, this, is, this is it. Uh, another reason that uh, we exaggerate the effects of drugs, uh, 
it allows us to target people that, uh, that we don't like without explicitly saying so. Now, you know, um, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna give an example of this with race. I'm gonna talk a little bit about racial discrimination and racism. It's so hard to talk about this racism and, and racial discrimination in our country at this moment. In part because we're so divided as a country. And people on the left, people on the right, the arguments are so low level, it just frustrates me. And so I'm trying my best not to be divisive. I'm trying my best just to point out the facts. And trying my best not to like call people bad people because. Uh, I'm trying to figure this out, and I need your help. And if I am divisive, please let me know. Uh, but I'm trying not to do that sort of thing. I'm trying to actually make a contribution to our country because it's one of the few times that I'm really worried about where we're going as a group of Americans. I worry about my American brothers and sisters. Um, So as I, as I use the term racism, I, I must define it, and so we all are on the same page. It's a simple definition. I just simply mean an action that results in a disproportionate, unjust, or unfair treatment of persons from a specific racial group. That's all I mean. I'm not talking about intent. I don't know what's in the person's head, nor do I care. It's not because if the action, this sort of disproportionate negative impact has happened to a group, it's felt and it's real, even though the persons may not have meant for that to happen. It doesn't make that person a bad person who has participated in it, but it does mean that it's still real. Uh, and so I'm, just, I'm gonna give you just a quick drug example and then, because I'm, this is abstract at the moment, I'll give you a quick drug example, and then that maybe, hopefully, that makes it clear what I'm talking about. Uh, this is a picture, this slide just shows uh, crack cocaine and powder cocaine. If you focus your attention to the left, that's powder cocaine. If you focus your attention to the right, that's crack cocaine. The only difference between the two is on the left, where you see the circle. Uh, the powder cocaine contains this thing called the hydrochloride salt. Uh, in order to smoke cocaine, you have to get rid of that hydrochloride salt. Some industrious people figured out that you can get rid of that hydrochloride salt simply by mixing uh, your powder cocaine in water and baking soda, heating it up, and then when it dries out, it comes back without the salt, and that's crap. That's just the cocaine free base. It's the only difference between the two forms of cocaine. They produce identical uh, pharmacological or biological effects. It's true when you, when you store cocaine, uh, the effects are delayed rather, uh, rather, rather relative to smoking crack cocaine. Um, smoking crack cocaine produces a more rapid onset of effects, that's true. But that's related to route of administration because when you dissolve powder cocaine in water and shoot it intravenously, it produces the identical sort of onset of effects and effects as smoking crack cocaine. So they are the same drug. We're all on the same page, they're the same drug. Just wanna make sure we're on the same page. But yet, in 1986, one of the things we did in the United States is that we passed this law that punished uh, crack cocaine violations 100 times more harshly than powder cocaine violations. Law in 1986, and then we um, extended that law in 1988 to uh, the law was first passed only for traffickers in 1988. It was extended to people who were simply possessing uh, crack cocaine, and also it was extended to people who were first time offenders. Uh, that was the first time in our history that we had done such a thing. And also, the, the 1988 law um, uh, included some language that I find funny. Uh, so I don't cry. Uh, but the, the, language, the language said that by 1995, now this is in 1988 when the law passed, it said by 1995, the United States would be drug free. 
and institutions that receive public funds would have to have in place policies to ensure that this happens. And we got the drug-free workplaces and those sorts of things. Now, I just find this remarkable that smart, intelligent people passed a law that indicated that we would be drug-free. No people on the history of the planet has ever been drug-free. You don't want to live in a place that's <laughs> Anyway, I, I got it. I'm sorry, I got it. I, I, got it. I, I was trying I was i trying to say, I'm trying to talk about racial discrimination. I'm sorry. Uh, when we think about this law, the law itself is not racist. I know people say that the law is racist. It's not. It's the enforcement of the law that we're concerned about. Uh, this is these are the people who've been convicted under the law. 80% of the people who've been convicted under the law are black. Even though black people don't use cocaine, uh, um, uh, don't represent the majority of the crack cocaine users, uh, uh, but they represent 80% of those people arrested for the law. Uh, since we're in Southern California, and I'll just give you a California example, um, to show how bad this was, uh, there was a study done by the U.S. Sentencing Commission in 1992 of L.A. County. Of nearly a thousand people arrested for crack in LA County, not one white person was prosecuted under this law. That's from the U.S. Sentencing Commission. But that just that just goes to show how the enforcement of the law was done in a racially discriminatory manner. The law itself is neutral, but it's how we are enforcing the law. Anyway, Barack Obama came along and said he was going to get rid of the law. He didn't. The law was modified to such that we no longer punish uh, uh, crack violations 100 times more harshly. We now punish them 18 times more harshly. As Malcolm X has said, Malcolm X beautifully spoke to this issue. Uh, he didn't realize, but he beautifully spoke to this issue when he said that if you stab me in the back with a nine-inch knife, and then you pull it out six inches, that's not justice. And that's kind of what we're having here. Um, okay, uh, moving on. That's an example of racial discrimination. That, it's not to say that the cops or the police who were going out to enforce that law are racist. That's not what I'm saying. That in order to call them racist, there are, there's another step that's required. It just simply means, I mean, there are people who are just doing their job, doing what they were told to do. Uh, so I don't, I don't, I don't want to. Uh, I want to be clear about how I use these terms. Now, with the current opioid crisis, it gives us another opportunity to exert our sort of racism in drug law enforcement. Um, now, let, let me just, well, well, the main, the, the governor of Maine can say it better than me because he says what we do with our drug policy and what we've been doing with our drug policy in this country, but nobody has been stupid enough to articulate it. <laughs> but here's one, here, here check this out about out-of-state drug dealers coming to Maine in response to a question. It's a topic he discusses at a lot of town hall forums. Here's what he said last night. The traffickers, these are people that take drugs. These are guys of the name D-Money, Smoothie, Shifty, uh, these type of guys that come from Connecticut, New York. They come up here, they sell their heroin, then they go back home. Incidentally, half the time they impregnate a young white girl before they leave. <laughs> which is a real step that the men have another issue and we've got to deal with it down the road. We have to take away their children. <laughs> That's not our other. Um, but uh, the, go the governor of the page nicely described what we were doing. He separated skillfully. He wasn't talking about the users of opioids. He's talking about the traffickers of opioids. Now, one of the things that we know is that 
Uh, most of the opioid users in the country are white. And this is, again, not to divide us. This is just fact. This is just fact. Um, um, and we also know that most people buy drugs from people of their own race. But when it comes to opioid uh, prosecution or arrests at the federal level, 80% of the people being arrested for opioid uh, trafficking in this country today at the federal level are black and Latino, 80%. So we can see how these things continue, this pattern continues. Now, I'm going to wrap up here, but before I leave, I just want to say a news flash. I got a news flash. So when we hear people talking about the drug problem, it has little or nothing to do with drugs. It has everything to do like with economic opportunity for me, the researchers, for the law enforcement, a number of people. Uh, subjugation of despised groups, apathy, apathy towards those people who are less fortunate. It has to do with all of those kind of issues. If it had to do with drugs, we would be doing things differently. We would, our policies would be based on our knowledge of pharmacology. Our education would be based on our knowledge of pharmacology. We'd be teaching people some basics, like as it relates to the opioids or the crisis. Please avoid specific com uh, combinations. Making sure people have drug testing to make sure that they don't have adulterants in their opioids and that sort of thing. All of these things we know. Uh, we'd be teaching them about dose, the importance of dose for toxicity. Uh, teaching them about different, sh different routes of administration. Teaching them about tolerance, how tolerance is protective. We'd be teaching them about the setting. Make sure you use a drug like marijuana if you're a novice in an environment that's comfortable, not in an anxiety-provoking environment. All of these kinds of things we would be teaching our citizens. And we have paid for this knowledge you have with your tax dollars. But we haven't taught people these kinds of things. Also, if, 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 if we were really, if this, wasn't re if this was really about drugs, we would think about it from a more humane perspective. We would think about it in terms of Respecting people just like we respect people's right to engage in other activities that carry some risk, like sexual behaviors, like driving a car, like buying a, buying a gun. You know, all of these sorts of things, we respect your right to do this as an adult. But we don't respect your right to take a drug as an adult. Remarkable. You can go out and buy a gun that's designed to kill someone. Now, this is not to say that we shouldn't have that right. But we have that right, but we don't have the right to go out and buy cocaine. Uh, so we have to think about all of these things as we uh, think about how we are dealing with drugs in the society. Now I'm just going to recap and then close. Just recap, recap. Just want to let us know that we are misled about drug education. That's our standard. Drug use is rational. Uh, most people who use drugs do not become addicted. The assumption that prenatal cannabis exposure causes this inevitable sort of detrimental effects on cognitive functioning, it should just be reevaluated and we should just be careful about what we're saying about this. Uh, and then racism, we have to remember, is an important tool in drug law enforcement. As one of my buddies who is a judge in Houston said, uh, particularly as it relates to marijuana laws in the South side, he said, we need it for probable cause. And we need to be able to say, I smelled marijuana in the car, and so I could mistreat you. Now I'll close. What can you do? You can help me in changing the education. Make sure when people are talking about drugs, that it's from an informed perspective. And saying that my brother used, or I used, or that's not informed. That's not informed. That, 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 that alone is not informed. Make sure people are using, speaking about it from an informed perspective. We have to change the narrative about who the drug users are. People have to get out of the closet. People need to know 
that their plenary speaker is a drug user. People need to people need to know that the responsible people in the communities are the drug users. Uh, that's the that's the that's the typical drug use. And that might mean that we have to implement strategies that deal with the real problem. That might mean that we have to make sure people have drug purity testing such that they are not being exposed to adulterants that are potentially more harmful, which are in many cases more harmful than the drug that people see. And we have to constantly evaluate the risk-benefit ratio. Whatever changes that we do, we have to make sure it's not producing more harm than benefit. We have been slow on this in this country in terms of our drug policy, uh, but we have to remember whatever change we make, we have to be cognizant of this risk-benefit ratio. Now, this formula is not one for popularity, but that's not what I seek. Uh, I hope that's not what you seek. Um, and I want to leave you with a quote from Lorraine Hansberry when she said that the thing that makes you exceptional, exceptional, if you are at all, is inevitably that which must make you lonely. And it's lonely to say these kind of things in public because it's not popular. And when you say these kind of things in a place like Manila, the Philippines, the president of the country comes out and attacks you. And then their Sunday paper makes the cartoon and make fun, makes fun of you. This is me, of course. And I said in the Philippines that uh, the president said that methamphetamine shrinks your brain. I said something simple like, there's no evidence for that. Science does not show that. And I got attacked. I got run out of the country. Uh, and this is the cartoon that appeared in their Sunday paper um, the, 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 the following week. And this cartoon is basically making fun of me preaching to a bunch of people who use shabu, which is methamphetamine, they call it. Um, and so, again, it's not a popular thing to do, uh, what I'm doing, but I hope 